Hey Pioneer, it's Mrs. Wills, your school librarian, and I am back to read a little bit more of the one and only Ivan with you. So we're going to start today on page 60 with change. Stella is the first to notice the change, but soon we all feel it. A new animal is coming to the big top mall. How do we know this? Because we listen, we watch, and most of all, we sniff the air. Humans always smell odd when change is in the air, like rotten meat with a hint of papaya. Guessing. Bob fears our new neighbor will be a giant cat with slitted eyes and a coiled tail. But Stella says a truck will arrive this afternoon carrying a baby elephant. How do you know, I ask. I sample the air, but all I smell is caramel corn. I love caramel corn. I can hear her, Stella says. She's crying for her mother. I listen. I hear the cars charging past. I hear the snore of the sun bears in their wired domain, but I don't hear any elephants. You're just hoping, I say. Stella closes her eyes. No, she says softly. Not hoping, not at all. Jumbo. My TV is off, so while we wait for the new neighbor, I ask Stella to tell us a story. Stella rubs her right foot against the wall. Her foot is swollen again, an ugly deep red. If you're not feeling well, Stella, I say, you could take a nap and tell us a story later. I'm fine, she says, and she carefully shifts her weight. Tell us the Jumbo story, I say. It's a favorite of mine, but I don't think Bob has ever heard it. Because she remembers everything, Stella knows many stories. I like colorful tales with black beginnings and stormy middles and cloudless blue sky endings. But any story will do. I'm not in a position to be picky. Once upon a time, Stella begins, there was a human boy. He was visiting a gorilla family at a place called a zoo. What's a zoo? Bob asks. He's a street smart dog, but there's not much he hasn't seen. Or there's much he hasn't seen, excuse me. A good zoo, Stella says, is a large domain, a wild cage, a safe place to be. It has room to roam and humans who don't hurt. She pauses, considering her words. A good zoo is how humans make amends. Stella moves a bit, groaning softly. The boy stood on a wall, she continues, watching, pointing, but he lost his balance and fell into the wild cage. Humans are clumsy, I interrupt. If only they would knuckle walk, they wouldn't topple so often. Stella nods. A good point, Ivan. In any case, the boy lay in a motionless heap while the humans gasped and cried. The silverback, whose name was Jumbo, examined the boy, as was his duty, while his troop watched from a safe distance. Jumbo stroked the child gently. He smelled the boy's pain, and then he stood watch. When the boy awoke, his humans cried out, Stay still! Don't move! Because they were certain, humans are always certain about things, that Jumbo would crush the boy's life from him. The boy moaned. The crowd waited, hushed, expecting the worst. Jumbo led his troop away. Men came down on ropes and whisked the child to waiting arms. Was the boy all right? Bob asks. He wasn't hurt, Stella says, although I wouldn't be surprised if his parents hugged him many times that night in between their scoldings. Bob, who has been chewing his tail, pauses, tilting his head. Is that a true story? I always tell the truth, Stella replies although I sometimes confuse the facts. Lucky. I've heard the Jumbo story many times. Stella says that humans found it odd that the huge silverback didn't kill the boy. Why, I wonder, was that so surprising? The boy was young, scared, alone. He was, after all, just another great ape. Bob nudges me with his cold nose. Ivan, he says, why aren't you and Stella in a zoo? I look at Stella. She looks at me. She smiles sadly with her eyes, just a little, the way only elephants can do. Just lucky, I guess.
she says. Arrival. The new neighbor arrives after the four o'clock show. When the truck comes lumbering toward the parking lot, Bob scampers over to inform us. Bob always knows what's happening. He's a useful friend to have, especially when you can't leave your domain. With a groan, Mac lifts the sliding metal door near the food court, the place where deliveries are made. A big white truck is backing up to the door, belching smoke. When the driver opens the truck, I know that Stella is right. A baby elephant is inside. I see her trunk poking out from the blackness. I'm glad for Stella, but when I glance at her, I see she is not glad at all. Stand back, everyone, Mac yells. We've got a new arrival. This is Ruby, folks. 600 pounds of fun to save our sorry butts. This gal is going to sell us some tickets. Mac and two men climb into the black cave of the truck. We hear a noise, scuffling, a word Mac uses when he's angry. Ruby makes a noise, too, like one of the little trumpets they sell at the gift store. Move, Mac says, but there still is no Ruby. Move, he says again. We haven't got all day. Inside her domain, Stella paces as much as she's able. Two steps one way, two steps the other. She slaps her trunk against rusty metal bars. She grumbles. Stella, I ask, did you hear the baby? Stella mutters something under her breath, a word she uses when she's angry. Relax, Stella, I say, it will be okay. I then, Stella says, it will never, ever be okay. And I know enough to stop talking. Stella helps. The men are still yelling. Some of the yelling is at each other, but most of it is at Ruby. We hear scrambling, pounding, shifting. The side of the truck shudders. I'm starting to like this elephant, Bob whispers. I'm getting the big one, Mac says. Maybe she can coax the stupid brat out of the truck. Mac opens Stella's door. Come on, girl, he urges. He unties the rope attached to the floor bolt. Stella pushes past Mac, nearly knocking him over. She rushes as best she can, limping heavily toward the open back door of the truck. She catches her swollen foot on the edge of the ramp and winces. Blood trickles down. Halfway up the ramp, she pauses. The noise in the truck stops. Ruby falls silent. Slowly, Stella makes her way up the rest of the ramp. It groans under her weight, and I can tell how much she's hurting by the awkward way she moves. At the top of the incline, she stops. She pokes her trunk into the emptiness. We wait. The tiny gray trunk appears again. Shyly, it reaches out, tasting the air. Stella curls her own trunk around the babies. They make soft, rumbling sounds. We wait some more. A hush falls over the entire Big Top Mall. Thud, thud. Step, step, pause. Step, step, pause. And there she is, so small she can fit underneath Stella with room to spare. Her skin sags and she sways unsteadily as she makes her way down the ramp. Not the greatest specimen, Max says, but I got her cheap from this bankrupt circus out west. They had her shipped over from Africa, only had her a month before they went bust. He gestures towards Ruby. Thing is, people love babies. Baby elephants, baby gorillas. Heck, give me a baby alligator, and I could make a killing. Stella ushers Ruby toward her domain. Mac and the two men follow. At Stella's door, Ruby hesitates. Mac gives Ruby a shove, but she doesn't budge. Doggone it, get a clue, Ruby, he mutters. But Ruby isn't moving, and neither is Stella. Mac grabs a broom. He raises it. Instantly, Stella steps in front of Ruby to shield her. Get in the cage, both of you, Mac shouts. Stella stares at Mac, considering. Gently but firmly, using her trunk, she nudges Ruby into her domain. Only then does Stella enter. Mac slams the door shut with a clang. I see two trunks entwined. I hear Stella whispering. Poor kid, says Bob. Welcome to the Exit 8. Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan. Old News 
When Julia comes, she sits by Stella's domain and watches the new baby. She barely talks to me. Stella doesn't talk to me either. She's too busy nuzzling Ruby. She is cute, little Ruby, with her ears flapping like palm leaves, but I am handsome and strong. Bob trots a circle around my belly before settling down in just the right spot. Give it up, Ivan, he says. You're old news. Julia gets out a piece of paper and a pencil. I can see that she is drawing Ruby. I move to the corner of my domain to pout. Bob grumbles. He doesn't like it when I disrupt his naps. Homework, Julia's father scolds. Julia sighs and puts her drawing aside. I grunt and Julia glances in my direction. Poor old Ivan, she says. I've been ignoring you, haven't I? I grunt again, a dignified, indifferent grunt. Julia thinks for a moment, then smiles. She walks over to my domain, to the spot in the corner where the glass is broken. She slides papers through. She rolls a pencil across my cement floor. You can draw the baby elephant too, Julia says. I bite the pencil in half with my magnificent teeth. Then I eat some paper. Tricks. Even after Julia and her father leave, I try to keep sulking, but it's no use. Gorillas are not, by nature, powders. Stella, I call. It's a full moon, did you see? Sometimes when we are lucky, we catch a glimpse of the moon through the skylight in the food court. I did, Stella says. She is whispering, and I realize that Ruby must be all asleep. Is Ruby all right? I ask. She's too thin, Ivan, Stella says. Poor baby, she was in that truck for days. Mac bought her from a circus the same way he bought me, but she hadn't been there long. She was born in the wild, like us. Will she be okay, I ask? Stella doesn't answer my question. The circus trainers chained her to the floor, Ivan, all four feet, 23 hours a day. I puzzle over why this would be a good idea. I always try to give humans the benefit of the doubt. Why would they do that, I finally ask. To break her spirit, Stella says, so she could learn to balance on a pedestal, so she could stand on her hind legs, so a dog could jump on her back while she walked in mindless circles. I hear her tired voice, and I think of all the tricks Stella has learned. Introductions. When I awake the next morning, I see a little trunk poking out between the bars of Stella's domain. Hello, says a small, clear voice. I'm Ruby. She waves her trunk. Hello, I say. I'm Ivan. Are you a monkey? Ruby asks. Certainly not. Bob's ears perk up, although his eyes stay closed. He's a gorilla, he says, and I am a dog of uncertain heritage. Why did the dog climb your tummy? Ruby asks. Because it's there, Bob murmurs. Is Stella awake, I ask? Aunt Stella's asleep, Ruby says. Her foot is hurting, I think. Ruby turns her head. Her eyes are like Stella's, black and long-lashed, bottomless lakes fringed by tall grass. When is breakfast, she asks. Soon, I say, when the mall opens and the workers come. Where, Ruby twists her head in the other direction. Where are the other elephants? It's just you and Stella, I say, and for some reason I feel we have let her down. Are there more of you? Not, I say, at the moment. Ruby picks up a piece of hay and considers it. Do you have a mom and dad? Well, I used to. Everyone has parents, Bob explains. It's unavoidable. Before the circus, I used to live with my mom and my aunt and my sisters and my cousins, Ruby says. She drops the hay, picks it up, twirls it. They're dead. I don't know what to say. I'm not really enjoying this conversation, but I can see that Ruby isn't done talking. To be polite, I say, I'm sorry to hear that, Ruby. Humans killed them, she says. Who else? Bob asks, and we all fall silent. All right, my friends, I will see you back here tomorrow for another reading.